Hey guys, today's video topic is quite interesting. We are checking out undervolting and underclocking of retro processors. Today we're gonna deep dive into the Intel Pentium MMX 233 and we also have an AMD, it's the K63 Plus 400. Most of us are very familiar with overclocking. Back in the day, the idea was you grab a budget or a lower end processor and then by raising the clock frequency maybe you had to change some dip switches or jumpers on the motherboard yeah you could extract more performance getting better value for your money the downside was you might have been facing some instability issues definitely more heat more power consumption and maybe more noise we will do a little bit of overclocking in this video just because it fits the topic. So we will take the Pentium MMX to around 300 megahertz and of course the K6 3 Plus to around 600 megahertz. This is pretty much the fastest Super Socket 7 processor you can get. But what about undervolting and underclocking? Why would you do that? Well, the main reason is to extend the life of retro parts. You might not need all this performance. So let's say you have a Pentium MMX running at 233 megahertz. Most DOS games, if you downclock it to 133 megahertz, you will not notice a difference. Yes, there are some games like 3D games. Let's say you're playing Tomb Raider at 640 by 480. Here you want the fastest clock speed available, but maybe you are running speed sensitive games. You will disable the CPU and the motherboard caches to mimic the performance of a 386, you don't need your CPU running at 233 megahertz. And by reducing the clock speed and especially by reducing the voltage, we can save on power consumption, heat, temperature, and extend the life for our retro parts, basically looking after them. This video is brought to you by PCBWay, our channel sponsor. Your one-stop shop for printed circuit boards manufacturing and assembly, but also CNC machining, 3D printing and more. Check the video description for links and more information. Here we have all the parts that we're using for the test system today. So let's take a closer look. Here we have the motherboard. It is from Gigabyte, the GA5AX. A very beautiful Super Socket 7 mainboard. We have an AGP video card. This one is from Diamond and it's got the NVIDIA River TNT2 graphics chip. VGA out and it's a very nice video card. I decided to add a sound card because we will be doing some power measurement figures and yeah, you will have a sound card for a retro gaming PC. It is the Creative Labs Sound Blaster AWE64 value. For storage, we're using a SD card to ID adapter. They work really well, especially for projects in MS-DOS. This is the user manual of our main board and it definitely makes life easier if you have access to one of these. On the second page, we have a beautiful table with all the configurations possible. And we start with setting these ones here. These set the front side bus as well as the speed for AGP. And later we can also do some overclocking. So the Intel Pentium MMX has a FSB of 66 megahertz. And also we don't wanna overclock the AGP bus. So we also choose 66. So these are the four jumpers that we need to configure on the main board. Here are the four jumpers that set the clock speeds. So the front side bus and also the speed of the AGP bus. And down here we've got the dip switch. There are eight switches in total to configure both the multiplier. So that's the first three switches and then the voltage. Next up, we change the CPU multiplier. So with a FSB of 66 and a multiplier of 3.5, we're getting 233 megahertz. So on the dip switch, the switches one, two, and three, we need to set them all to the off position. 
Something I want to point out is that the 3.5x multiplier shares the same settings as the 1.5x. And I believe on the Pentium MMX, you can't use the 1.5x multiplier. You can do so on the regular Pentium, but not on the Pentium MMX. And finally, we need to set the CPU voltage. And that's what this table is for. The stock voltage on the Pentium MMX is 2.8 volts. So that is the V core. And here we have the dip switches, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So we need to configure them to off, off, off. Number seven is on, and then number eight is off again. The system is up and running, and now I'm running a lot of tests. So basically I'm looking for instability and I'll record all the results, including how much power the entire machine consumes in a spreadsheet and we will go over these results. If you want to replicate what I'm doing today, I'm using the MS-DOS starter pack, which you can download from my website, choosing the extended memory option. I then load the Unisound initialization software to get our Sound Blaster up and running. And next we have DOS Bench, which is also available from my website to download. So with testing the stability, there are many approaches. And because time is always crucial, I don't have too much time. I'm using Quake, the Quake benchmark as a rough way to measure stability. I'm not quite sure why, but Quake seems to be stressing the silicon on CPUs a little bit more than the other benchmarks on the DOS bench pack. And it's usually the first benchmark that crashes when doing any overclocking or undervolting. So keep that in mind. I'm not promising you that these results are rock solid and stable. It's a quick method to dial in sort of where are we in terms of getting a stable system. Here we go. Here we have our first result. So this is the Pentium MMX 233 running at the stock frequency with the stock 2.8 volts and the power meter is showing 50 watts. Now this is for the entire system. And now it's a process of changing the dip switches, slowly lowering the voltage. And I have the results here in a table. I got all the way down to 2.2 volts where I saw a crash to desktop. And we can see how the power consumption is slowly going down. So with 2.3 volts, the Quake benchmark completed successfully and I saw a reading of 44.8 watts. So at 2.2 volts, the system is crashing in Quake. So the next step is to keep the same voltage, but I am reducing the clock speed and then I will keep lowering the voltage. And whenever I get a crash, we go down in the clock speed and rinse and repeat. Here we have the results with the Pentium MMX running at 200 megahertz. It's now stable at the Quake benchmark at 2.2, 2.1 and two volts. But once we got to 1.9 volts, another crash to desktop. And at two volts, we can see the power consumption is now around 10 watts lower with a result of 40.8 watts. Reducing the frequency now to 166 megahertz. And we can see again at 1.9 volts, it's passing the benchmark. We can lower it down a little bit further until 1.7 volts. We get a no post at 1.6 volts and look at the result at 1.7 volts, 38.4 watts for the entire system. And lastly, I'm reducing the clock speed to 133 megahertz. At 1.6 volts, the Quake benchmark completes. And this is now a quite significant power reduction. Any lower and I wasn't able to post the machine. So for me, 1.6 volts was the lowest I was able to use this processor with. So what we're seeing is what we expected. The lower the clock speed, the lower we can put the voltage. And with a Pentium MMX 233, if you don't need that speed, configure it for 133 megahertz and you can run it at a very low voltage, reducing the power consumption, the heat, the noise. Maybe you get away with a passive cooler, some case airflow. So there are lots of possibilities for you to do some tweaking.
And now let's have a look at overclocking. Here are the results. We also have some benchmarks. For overclocking, we basically use this table here and then we're gonna move up the frequencies and we will try to extract as much performance as we can. I'll start off with setting the FSB to 100 megahertz because this is a Super Socket 7 motherboard. Overclocking the FSB usually gives you a nice performance boost. For example, if we configure the processor to run with a 100 megahertz FSB and a multiplier of 2x, it will run at 200 megahertz and the benchmarks will be faster than the processor running at 233 megahertz with the stock 66 megahertz FSB. So a higher FSB can counteract a lower clock speed of the processor. These are the results for the Quake benchmark at 320 by 200. So on the left side, we have the stock results. We can see the Pentium MMX at 233 megahertz, 53.4 is the result. Then And then on the right side, we can see the overclocked results up to 275 megahertz. I did not have to raise the voltage, but to get higher, I had to increase the voltage, especially at 300 megahertz. I needed 3.3 volts, which is quite a bit higher, but we're getting a pretty nice result of 77.4 FPS. The AMD CPU is next. This is a very nice model. It's the K6 3 Plus, rated at 400 megahertz with a very low voltage of 1.6. So that means we're starting off already with a low voltage, so not too many uh, benchmark results to do on this one. Here we go at the stock configuration, which means we're running at 400 megahertz with a voltage of 1.6. We're getting a power consumption of 44.8. What I'm doing next is I'm trying to overclock the CPU as much as I can. And at 550 megahertz, Quake still completes stable with a power reading of 48 watts, but 600 megahertz is too much. As soon as I set the 6x multiplier with set mal, I'm getting a crash. Now I'm lowering the voltage to 1.5 volts. At 550 megahertz, the benchmark is now crashing, but at 500 megahertz, it still completes with a power reading of 45.6 watts. At 1.4 volts, the 500 megahertz benchmark also completes and we get a power reading of 44 watts. And finally, 1.3 watts. This is the lowest I can configure this motherboard. It fails uh, the 500 megahertz benchmark. As soon as I run set mal to set the multiplier, it crashes. But at 450 megahertz, the benchmark completes just fine. So with this AMD processor, we couldn't save as much power compared to the Pentium MMX because this one is already a mobile CPU, has already a very low V-core, so there was not much to be gained, just a tiny bit. But what about overclocking? Let's have a look. And here we go. Let's see what it takes to get the processor stable at 600 megahertz. With 1.7 volts, the benchmark crashes, but with 1.8 volts, Look at that, it's passing the Quake benchmark and we're getting a result of 52.8 watts for the entire system. And 52.8 watts, that is only around 3 watts more than the Pentium MMX 233 at stock settings. That is unbelievable. So we're getting a 600 megahertz CPU that is much faster with just three watts more of total system consumption. Let's run the Quake benchmark on the CPU and see how it compares to the Intel Pentium MMX. Here we have the chart and yeah, the K6 3 Plus at 600 megahertz wins all the competitions. 101.9 FPS, that is way faster than the Pentium MMX. Look at the stock result of the MMX, 55 so this just shows how much faster this AMD K6 processor is compared to the options you have from Intel. So guys, that was my little investigation into undervolting and underclocking of two popular retro processors. I know there's a big focus on overclocking and extracting the maximum performance out of parts, but I really don't like overclocking these vintage, these retro parts. 
If you want something faster, just get a Pentium 4 or Pentium 3 or a slot 1 machine. You don't need to overclock the SuperSocket 7 platform. In my opinion, this platform shines in terms of being able to slow it down and having a flexible machine that can run DOS games from the 386 era up to something like Tomb Raider at 640 by 480. And by reducing the voltage, we can extend the life of these processors, lower the heat, maybe get away with a more quieter cooler. And that's always a good thing. I'm very curious to hear if anyone else out there has done some undervolting and underclocking with their retro computers to reduce the power consumption, the heat and the noise. And I want to hear from you. What are your experiences? Which processor did you use? What sort of voltage reduction were you able to get away with? Especially with the Pentium MMX, I was quite surprised. Uh, once you lower the clock speed, you can really dial down the voltage and we can see quite a significant savings in terms of power consumption. So yeah, there you have it. That was my quick investigation into undervolting and underclocking two uh, popular retro processors. I love to hear from you. Leave comments down below. Thank you for watching my videos and thank you for all the support and I shall see you soon with another one.